because of what the Lord is doing, I get to travel a lot. And I see a lot of road signs. And I'm still 12 years old, and I still have difficulty looking at the sign, reading the sign, and choosing to obey the sign. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> if you didn't go on that trip with us, talk to Evelyn, she'll tell you. Pastor has a problem with a lot of signs uh, still I see the suggestions, not mandates. And I'm working on that. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> signs have a purpose. And the purpose of a sign, whether it's a road sign or one of the signs that John gives us in his book, the purpose of a sign is to point to a reality beyond itself. When you see a stop sign, it points to a reality beyond itself. An intersection or some uh, oncoming traffic, and you need to stop. The curve that says 25 miles an hour is there before you get to the reality of the curve. It points to something beyond this. So far, by the time you get to chapter 12 in John, there have been six signs. In chapter 2, he turns water into wine. Now, if you've been with us on Wednesday night, you understand the background and why some of them have their mouths going, oh yeah, this is great. Turn water into wine. Then in chapter 4, there's the nobleman's son who's healed. A Gentile son healed. Somebody that the insider said didn't need God. If you're here today and people are telling you that you are somehow less than everybody else, hear me. The second sign that John gives is to people like you. God wants to heal you. Healing of the cripple. Chapter 5. One of my favorites was the bread that was given in chapter 6 in the desert. Where there was no food, where there was no hope of food, where all was dry and dusty and lost, and there was a hunger physically gnawing away, Jesus provides food for them in the desert. What about the blind man? Chapter 9, who is healed, blind from birth, healed. Mm. Chapter 11, the last time we were together, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, six signs. Mm. Again, we don't have time to go into all the details of why it's important, but every one of these were pointing toward a reality beyond themselves. Every miracle in the Bible isn't God just doing something, going, woohoo, look what I can do. You try it. That's not what he's doing. That's what we would do, which is another proof of the two laws. Number one, there is a God, and number two, we are not him. Every miracle had a purpose, and the purpose of these six miracles was to point to a reality beyond themselves. Here's the reality. God is here now. Things can be different. One sign remains. And in chapter 12, Jesus is talking about this sign that remains. And the sign was very confusing. I have dyslexia. Many of you know that. Just listen to me read. You should try zipping down a freeway with dyslexia trying to find your exit. It's a little confusing. This it's okay to laugh. It is funny. So you're, like, you're, laughing? you're all taller than me. <laughs> this last sign was the most important sign. And it was so different from anything they ever expected that they had a hard time visualizing what the sign was saying. The seventh sign. The sign that makes all the difference 2,000 years ago and today was Jesus looking them in the eye and saying, I will die and rise from the dead. The reason they had a problem with that sign is because that's not how reality works. When you go, you are gone. And Jesus looked at people who had been to funeral after funeral after funeral and said, yes, you will be in mine, but I will rise again in the same body three days after. 
and they couldn't comprehend God's reality being so different from theirs. Some of us fail to walk in joy, peace, and purpose because even today we cannot understand God's reality being any bigger than what we want it to be. We want God's reality to be from 10 o'clock to 11.30 on Sunday. The rest of the time is mine, and if I really need God, I need Him to be there. So when I scream out, He can help me. But unless I scream, you stay there, I stay here, I'll see you on Sunday. And then we wonder why we lack purpose, joy, and peace. It's because we are living as if the reality of God didn't impact our life. But when we understand that our God, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, had the power to let His life be taken and the power to bring Himself back from the grave. There is not a problem. There is not a situation. There is not a struggle. There is not a doubt, a fear, a sickness, an illness. There is not an attack of the enemy that can dissuade us from having joy and peace and a sense of purpose. Because if God overcame the grave, He can overcome what is taking place in the life of the living. Amen. When we live as if God is in the grave, our hope is dead. But when we live under the new reality that Jesus signed, spoke to, He is God, everything else is going to be okay. So how do we respond to the sign? A lot of us respond to the sign the way I respond to signs on the road. No, we do. Feel the Lord moving in our heart during worship. We don't want to get emotional. We feel the Lord saying, I want you to pray this blessing, which I don't want to stand out. We sense God convicting us through a message. And we say, well, I, I don't want to be bothered with that right now. I'm going to, I'm going to analyze that a little bit. And that's, that's Steve's big issue there. I can analyze something until Jesus is done with me. He's moved on. Then I'm ready. He's like, sorry. Maybe next time. When I'm zipping down a road somewhere, I see all kinds of signs. Speed limit, caution, work ahead, uh, coffee shop, this exit. <laughs> Those I, I see very well. And I have to make a response as I'm flying down the road. How will I choose to respond to this? We do the same thing with Jesus when we're impacted by the reality that you can live in a new dimension. You can have joy, peace, and a sense of purpose. You're not just flowing through life wondering if there's a God out there, but you're willing to say, if you're out there, I need you. How do you respond to these signs that God makes a difference? See, in verse 37 and 38, that some people respond, even today, by simply refusing to believe. He's not going to do it. Notice what he says. Even though Jesus has performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe him. The sign said, slow, turn, 45 miles an hour. They're doing and they chose not to pay attention. So notice the prophet Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message and who has an arm of the Lord has been revealed to you? Who's seen what you've done? If you're here today or you're watching, you're absolutely choosing to refuse to look at the signs all around you that there is a God. You are not Him. And He wants you to have joy, peace, peace. And purpose in life. Do not blame God, your spouse, your friends, your church when you crash. <coughs> Sign is there, pointing to reality beyond itself. You can live a life better than what you have now. Don't blame everybody else that your foot is buried in the accelerator and you choose to refuse to believe the sign. Huh. Some of us still live as though we're going to get to heaven and going to say, well, God, I know you said this is the sign. Turn here one way, but I want to go the other. I thought it was an option. Jesus in chapter 12 says your own words condemn you. You saw the sign. You refused the sign. There is no 
While you are alive, there is hope. Don't squander it. Others of us choose to politely ignore the signs. I mean, we're not just so rude, we're going to say, ah, it's a lie. There is no God. Pond scum turned into fish, and fish turned into turtles, and turtles turned into something that flopped around on the ground, and eventually it learned to fly, and it got tired of flying, so it came down and grew hair, and it walked around like an ape, and then we had a remote control, and the ape turned into a man, and all we've done is sit around and watch TV ever since. <laughs> if you believe that, you have some intellectual issues. Uh-huh. Even hearing me say it, you go, that's not how it happened. <laughs> Duh. When we look around to everything around us, there is a reality of someone bigger than us that is out there. And he came in the name of Jesus Christ, lived, died, and rose again so that he who is out there can be here inside of you and you can experience a new dimension of life, the very dimension for which you were created. This is why you go through life wondering and always wanting more. Nothing is ever enough because you never grab hold of a one thing that matters. God! Mm. Man. So we don't ignore it and just say it's not fair, we want to be polite about it. We'll be agnostics. I'm sure there's a God out there, but I've never met him. And so until I meet him, I'm just not going to believe that he's there or not there. If he's there, fine. If he's not, fine. Like the individual, honest, true story, mm-hmm. during the Vietnam conflict, who was there in the jungle, who had on his necklace a cross, a star of David, a Buddha, and several other uh, star crescents, and several other uh, religious signs. And the guy asked him, he said, well, what are you doing? Pick one. He said, well, I'm just sort of an agnostic. I'm not even sure there's a God out there, but if he is, I don't want to make him mad because I may need him. Now, if you're trying to process that kind of logic, you're not alone. But many of us today, look at the signs of Jesus. I want you to have more joy, more peace. I want you to have a purpose and fulfill it. And yet we know that sometimes there is a cost involved. And so we politely pretend we are deaf. Or we say that famous prayer, Lord, here I am! Send them. goes on verse 39 and 40 and says this is why they were unable to believe. It says he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and be converted and I would heal them. So why would God do that? The same reason that your car slides off the road if you politely ignore the caution 45 mile an hour curve sign. Because reality is not going to twist to your belief system. God wants to untwist your belief system to correspond to his reality. And so we need to do what they did. Many of them did in verse 41. And that is simply believe it. This is a sign. I don't understand it all. I don't get it. I see a sign, but I don't see the reality yet. I'm just going to trust that this sign means there is something up there. 41 says that Isaiah said these things because he saw the glory of God and spoke about it. Isaiah saw the sign and his life was changed. Signs point to something bigger than us. But here's a really important thing we need to to grab. And that's why we're here today. Signs mean nothing if you can't see them. That's why it's illegal to drive at night without your lights on. Mm. It's not just so people can see you. Mm. Remember, you're not the center of the universe. Mm. It's so you can see the sign and the road and the deer and everything else. Mm. That house. (laughs) So how does God show the sign in the world? Mm. The light has come. And every one of you who is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are that light of Jesus. 
Every time you forgive, you're showing a sign of a new dimension of living. Every time you trust God and you're giving financially to church and ministries, you are showing the world that you believe in a ministry lifestyle, a new dimension bigger than your own wallet. Every time that you go out of your way and kill yourself to plan a VBS and then let everyone invade your property and then make a huge mess of it and then run out and hide before it's time to clean up. It wasn't that bad, but almost. What are you saying? You're saying, I believe in a dimension of reality far beyond any of this I'm assigning. Everything you do is a sign to the unbeliever that they can have joy and peace and purpose. Biblical terms, you don't take that light and put it under a basket. For purpose of our instruction, you don't take that sign, cut it down, bring it home and slide it under your bed. It doesn't do anybody any good. The sign needs to be out there where people see it. Christ saved you so that he could use you to save others. Your purpose in life is to do everything you do with an attitude of somebody's watching. Somebody needs to see what Jesus looks like in a situation like that. Joy comes from that sense of purpose because no matter what happens, it's bigger than me. It's bigger than this. And even if all of this ends and I die today, I am going to be with him. And peace comes from that because there is nothing that can be taken because the one thing that matters is yours for all of eternity, a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're here today or you're watching and you are not a follower of Lord Jesus Christ, please hear me be as... as a, pastoral as I can be. Stop ignoring the signs. Stop being so arrogant and believing you can drive through life like this. We've all done it. We have the scars to prove it doesn't work. Stop! Give your life to Why well, I don't understand it all. Welcome to the club. But do respond to what you understand. When I see signs on the road, I don't always understand why they're there until I get to what it's pointing. If you will come to Jesus and say, I am self-centered and selfish. I've been living my life as if your signs don't matter, but I'm coming to you. Please forgive me for living like that. Make me your kid. I will live for you. If you will say that to him, you will find that you move past the sign to the corresponding reality and Jesus will change your life. Peace, joy, and purpose will be yours. You're here. We're watching. I want you to pray with me. If you're accepting Jesus here, please tell somebody next to you because God blesses you for that. If you're doing this through the internet, please contact us and let us know because God will bless you because of that. Father, I'm not sure what I believe about you, but I know you're out there. And I do believe that Jesus was real, that he lived and died and rose from the dead. Forgive me for living as if it didn't matter. I'm giving my life to you. If you're real and if you save me, I will follow you. And whatever you show me, I'll respond to it. I just need to live with some peace, with some joy and a sense of purpose. And I know you're the one to give it to me. Thank you for making me your child. In Jesus' name, <coughs> amen. amen. We hold our hands. I ask you to take a moment and get them prepared. Signs. Signs of what happened in April all those years ago. When Christ on the night that he was betrayed took bread and cup and gave them a sign that they could take with them that corresponded to a new reality. What you hold is a wafer that represents the body of Jesus Christ. That was broken so your brokenness can be mended. Broken 
so your brokenness can be mended. And the cup which represents his blood, which was poured out to pay the price for our selfishness, our ignoring of the signs, and give us the ability to live a new dimension of life. Joy. Peace. In just a moment, we're going to pray over these and we're going to partake of them. And as we do, I'm going to believe God with you that He is going to mend you physically, spiritually, and emotionally. That He is going to give you a renewed sense of forgiveness, joy, peace, and purpose. That we will live in the reality that these signs point to. So, Father, we thank you that you gave Jesus Christ. That his body was broken. That we might be mended. That as his flesh was torn, we can be woven together into a new family. <coughs> Father, I'm asking in the name of Jesus, and we are believing you for a miracle this morning. That as we partake of the sign of your son, that the reality of who he is will mend our broken hearts, mend our broken thoughts, mend our broken spirits, mend every aspect of our life that has been broken. You are our life. And we accept from you everything you have to give. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together and receive the miracle. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that even though our self-centeredness and our egos, our sin is so, so huge, that it keeps us from you, you gave payment that we might be accepted again. That Jesus willingly gave his life, poured out his blood in payment. For our ignoring the signs. So Father I ask for every one of your children this morning. That as we partake a genuine sense of forgiveness, peace, joy and purpose. Would be reestablished in our hearts and minds. Where the enemy has taken opportunity to come in and to steal and kill and destroy. That your blood will cast him out. That he will find no place to torment anymore. Father, we thank you for what's about to happen. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's receive the miracles. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come to your father's house today, and he's met you here. You were able to be a part of the message we did on why it's good when things go bad. Then you're already prepared for what may come when you leave your father's house. If not, it's available on your church website. Please understand me. When you leave, because you have understood a new reality, the enemy is going to want to steal from you the blessing before it begins. So when things start to go wrong, this is your opportunity to say, this is what it looks like when Jesus is in the middle of a mess. Amen. The good fight of faith is not a fight that never happens. It's a fight you win. And greater is he who is in you than he who is in you. Thank you.